Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer and this week we have the Oscar winning filmmaker Alex Gibney. He's here with his new documentary, The Stylish and Shocking, Client 9. Was Elliot Spitzer's journey from New York hero to political zero really caused by his weakness for the ladies or his attacks on Wall Street? The Merrill Lynch lawyers, they came into my office and said we will pay a big sum of money if you promise to keep the information secret. And I said no. Alex Gibney tried to involve one of Spitz's special friends in the film, but that just didn't work out. Discussions finally broke down when she demanded final cut of the film. <laughs> <laughs> also on the show, potholing with revered German Werner Herzog, whose amazing 3D cave will make you feel funny. Sometimes we were overcome by a strange, irrational sensation. But first, in Lebanon, broadcast television's heavily controlled, but the internet's not, or yet. And so one of the most daring programs ever produced in the Middle East is Thriving Online. The beating heart of modern Lebanon, Beirut is in the midst of a second resuscitation. After 15 years of devastating civil war, followed by a 34-day Israel-Hezbollah war, which left over a 1,000 Lebanese civilians dead, and the infrastructure in tatters. With such a painful recent past, it's no wonder Lebanon's media mainstream favors fluffy soaps. Oh, but now, with the help of the internet, a radical new show has arrived. In a country where young people struggle to be heard, Shankaboot is a potent new production that covers taboo topics traditionally avoided by mainstream media, such as drug use, sex trafficking, <laughs> class inequality, and domestic abuse. Because we're not censored yet, uh, we, we're, we're sort of taking our, our freedom to talk about all these things, and, and the audience is loving it. With Shankaboot's double shot, a gritty social realism and witty observation. <laughs> its creators seem to have tapped into the very essence of modern Beirut. <laughs> Shankaboot's a hit with the critics, praised for its fresh look and natural performances, seldom seen on Arab television. Casting is a very, very important thing for us. From the start, we knew that we wanted to work with amateurs. Now we have quite a lot of professionals, but uh, uh, most of them are people we meet on the street. We all knew that the, the, the main thing was getting the, uh, the, the hero right. Without him, there is no Shankaboot. Happy-go-lucky delivery boy Suleiman and his trusty white scooter, the eponymous Shankaboot, are the reluctant heroes. People like Suleiman because uh, you can find Suleiman everywhere, each person. They're just trying to get by when their worlds collide with Ruweda. A wannabe superstar who flees an abusive marriage. <laughs> only to become entangled in a dark world of human trafficking. <laughs> to save the day, Suleiman must enlist the help of Shadi. <laughs> His mysterious best friend who walks a precarious path between the law and Lebanon's criminal underworld. Like Lebanon itself, the three protagonists are united by a desire to find peace and security and leave their troubled past behind them. <laughs> As the number of Arabic language websites grows at record speed, more and more young Arabs are switching off their TVs in favor of the internet. The web, you get a, a, a live feedback from your viewers. So you know what they feel, you know what they don't like, you know what they like, you know. You just throw out a subject and, you know, it's, it becomes like a forum. So this is 
the advantage of the new media. Now we have a, a, a platform on Shank Aboot called Shank Active, where any sort of young person who has a, a, a good little film related to Shank Aboot or the themes that we are discussing in Shank Aboot, they can upload it and put it up on Shank Active. <laughs> The recent thing that we did is uh, um, as a call for anything related to domestic workers working in the Arab world. And they're also spreading the word using street art and live shows. <laughs> and now they're taking it on the road. Our audience is like 16 to 25, even 30. And most of them do not know about Shankabut yet because they do not uh, have uh, good internet access. And we, we, we thought that why not go to them rather than them finding us. With YouTube views approaching half a million, 20,000 friends on Facebook. And an international digital Emmy, their sites are set on a full length feature film. Back in the day, Bollywood films were advertised with colourful hand-drawn posters that were more like street art rather than promotion. Sadly, those days are gone, but the images live on. It may be an oversized parody of 1970s Bollywood. But Om Shanti Om isn't exaggerating the importance of the huge hand-painted film posters. The giant images once adorned walls and cinemas across India. Films used to run because of them. Cinemas were decorated, big billboards were put in the market. And this attracted the people to the cinema. Madhukar worked on posters for such classics as Mughale Azam in an era when a poster was a worthwhile investment. In those days, films used to run for more than a year. Faces were big and they were huge so that they could be seen from a distance. Artists would work closely with film studios. We used to get black and white stills and then we used to compose and discuss which characters to highlight. Once approved, his images would be copied by other artists onto walls across India. We used to get tickets for the film premiere. Sometimes we would even sit with the actors. But by the 1990s, the painters were fighting a losing battle against digital photography and printing. If you have to see good art, then you will have to go to an art gallery. Otherwise, you can't see anything. Earlier, you could see them around cinema halls. As the craft dies out, art galleries are attracted to the super kitsch of these self-taught artists. The content being exaggerated, one of fill, of fill with marvel, so that allows the artists to actually use, uh, you know, marvelous colors. And so therefore it has a psychedelic effect of fantasy, of imagination, of the unreal. But while their posters are celebrated, the artists struggle to survive. Ashram, okay. We pay mythological characters, that is all. Hello everybody, welcome to this special screening of Client 9. Please, can you welcome the Oscar winning director, this is Alex Gibney. This is a film that really shows the downfall of Elliot Spitzer. Now, as a non-American, I knew hardly anything about him, but it certainly was compelling, and I wondered, why were you interested to tell this subject? Well, I think it's a classic tale of sex, money, and power, but this guy was also known as the Sheriff of Wall Street, and Wall Street was kind of the patient zero moment for the near collapse of the global economy. So for that reason, and for many classic reasons, this should be of interest to people all over the world. 
As a lowly New York district attorney, Elliot Spitzer ignored the usual suspects of muggers and murderers. He took on big business. He sued coal fire plants in Ohio for causing pollution in New York. He uncovered fraud in the pharmaceutical industry where pill makers hid the damage done by their drugs. He would take them all on because no one else would. He went after Wall Street giant Merrill Lynch for inflating their clients' stock prices. The Merrill Lynch lawyers, they came into my office and said, we will pay a big sum of money if you promise to keep the information secret. And I said, no. He then took on the world's largest insurer, AIG, for using dodgy deals to inflate its own stock price. The more we dug into AIG, the more problematic the company itself appeared to me to be. The disconcerting aspect of it was that it did appear to come from the very top. But when he got close to AIG's chairman, Wall Street deity Hank Greenberg, the feds told him, let it go. Michael Garcia sent me an over-the-top letter telling us to back off. But local hero Spitzer was already a shoe in for New York governor. If your point is things were as good as they could get, from a political perspective, I suppose that's right. But Spitzer had one fatal flaw. Secret heart, what are you made of? More than just an eye for the ladies. You said he wasn't that interested in the companionship. <laughs> when the press got wind of it, his downfall was swift and brutal. Tonight, Elliot Spitzer resigns as governor of New York. Where will he find comfort in this difficult time? And director oh. Alex Gibney keeps things entertaining. Start spreading the news. But his real interest is the evidence that Spitzer's enemies conspired to bring him down. Exhibit A, the hiring of notorious dirt digger Roger Stone. He had his high hair dyed. He was a swinger in literal terms. And the reporters, they're like, they thought of him as like a piece of work. Sure, I believe in the gonzo brand of uh, politics because you have to get, you gotta get people's attention. And exhibit B, the terrorist obsessed FBI suddenly interested in a New York brothel and especially its client nine. They just showed up at 8 a.m. and they said, we want to talk to you. We think you know what this is about. The shocking part of this film is not that Elliot had a call girl, or many. The, the shocking part is that the political gamemanship of this entire story, the federal money was used to investigate him, and uh, the palpable hate of his political opponents, you really capture that in the film, it's like a game. Well, it was, it was a game that they took very seriously because he had embarrassed them. And I think it's also very instructive. I mean, the Department of Justice really played a rather extraordinary role because if you think about it, no charges were ever brought. So I think the campaign of the Department of Justice was not to bring a charge against a sitting governor. It was to use their power to leak material to the press to embarrass a sitting governor and force him to resign. That's a political hit. The affidavit was full of steamy sexual banter and concerns about whether the client was difficult or even safe. Was the writing meant to convict the accused or embarrass the client? At what level does the personal become political and the political is the personal? I mean, what kind of inspires you to focus on this? I became very interested in the political utility to which sex scandals can be put. Roger Stone is this guy who came up with this notion that Elliot Spitzer wore knee-high black socks to make <laughs> sex. Now we're all laughing, but it's also damning and very embarrassing. So I ask you, what kind of guy f with his socks on? And it was picked by Roger Stone, whom I'm convinced made it up, because people like it so much, they inevitably print it. You Google black socks and Spitzer, it's amazing how many hits you get. Um, <laughs> But so that will always follow him, true or not. One question is why, you know, why hookers? I mean, why, particularly when that's, you know, illegal? You, you cave to temptations in a way that perhaps seems easier and, uh, and perhaps is, in some very twisted way, um, less damaging. I mean, certainly it, it's confessional. You said in this film specifically, look at his eyes. Where in the film do you feel that it's so revealing? We've heard from other people that he had this tremendous temper. There Call was it the twin Irwin, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, his evil twin Irwin is, is how it is revealed. That's how people, that's how his staffers referred to it. And there was one time where I confronted him with this exchange he had with this sort of genial old man, um, John Whitehead. You have fired the first bullet 
but believe me, by the end of this war, I will fire the last one, and you will be dead. Well, I don't think I said that. I mean, John White, I wouldn't say, I, I, look, I hope I didn't say that. Well, at a certain moment, his eyes narrow. He said it was a private conversation. You know, that's enough of that. You know, you could tell he, that was just the, a, a, the briefest peak at Irwin. He was screaming into the phone. He and I had a heated conversation. I will leave it at that. It was a private conversation. Did you f have any demands from the characters for payment for their involvement? I spent a long time trying to get Ashley Dupre to talk. Um, and ultimately, um, after talking with her PR people, her management team, uh, her criminal lawyer, and her entertainment attorney, <laughs> discussions finally broke down when she demanded final cut of the film. I'd still like to see that version. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley Dupre. I used to be on the front page of the New York Post. Now, I'm writing for it. That's right, I'm the New York Post's new advice columnist. She became this kind of figure that was used by the media, particularly the conservative Rupert, Rupert Murdoch media, to, um, to attack Spitzer. She was a stock character that they were able to use. So in a way, being able to use her as a stock character worked for the movie almost better than if, had she appeared. Ashley Dupre let the world believe that she was the Love Govs girl but she was only a one-night stand. There was someone who he enjoyed seeing most, and she was very pretty and a very intelligent girl and not a, not a fashion model. She's, uh, she had her own career. You heavily research your subjects, yet you found Angelina in, in a way that is hugely amusing through Facebook. <laughs> through our, our connections with people involved in the Empress Club uh, and other people, we did find her real name. Um, and then I plugged that real name in on Facebook. Mysteriously, um, there were a number of friends in common. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was able to go to one of those people and ask if they would arrange an introduction. And, and we agreed on a kind of a deal. She felt somewhat used by the federal investigators. Uh, but she would talk honestly, provided I not reveal her identity. I would like have my little rants about what was wrong with New York City that needed to be fixed. And he, he listened. <laughs> but I thought one of the most interesting things about her character was that she was so unlike the stereotype of a prostitute, that she was so affecting and, uh, as a human being and, and also such a truth teller. So how to convey that if the device used to portray her you know, turns her into a kind of a caricature? So I thought, well, uh, you know, I'll have an actress. An FBI guy kept pressing me. It's like he wanted to get some kind of information about some kinky sex stuff. And I flat out said, I don't see how any of that is relevant to your investigation. You really believe that she's the one who you really trusted what she said? I'm not saying she's the only one, but let's put it this way. A lot of other people in the film lie to me directly on camera. And we did check out Angelina's testimony rather carefully. You know. Everything she said, always checked out. The black socks thing isn't true. He wore low-cut socks, and he took them off. I mean, having done this film, I mean, what do you think about it? Do you think there's hope for the American system? I mean, they've almost... <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, all joking aside, I'm deeply uh, concerned and, and, and scared. The way our political system works, you know, I I campaigns are very expensive in the United States of America. And the only way you can pay for those campaigns is by going to people who are very wealthy and powerful and getting money from them. And that's why I think it was a, a great loss when Elliot Spitzer um, left the stage, because he was one of the few people who knew how power worked. He was unafraid. He had, um, how, do, how can I say this without fouling the censors? He, because he was wealthy, he had what he called FU money, um, meaning he didn't have to worry about being laid off. So he was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys, but there are very few people like that. I mean, like when you walk into a building on right. Wall Street, is it like turning the light on in the kitchen and the roaches just scatter <laughs> everywhere you well, go? You know, are you a beam of light? It is. The there w there Will was. Elliot return to public office? I think Elliot is dying to return to public office. He now has a TV show. That's the ultimate American comeback. When in doubt, get a TV show. Part of this film is that question of 
what was the real crime here? Was it a crime of passion that Elliot Spitzer committed, or was it the crimes on Wall Street that these powerful men that he was going after committed, which cost us all so much money? Thank you so much, Alex Gibney, for joining us and bringing Client 9. Everybody, please, thank you for joining us as well with your great questions. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. You say the work, but you haven't said the words. The work. Prostitution. Escort. Escort. What's the difference? Escort. What's the difference? This is the Ardèche River in southern France. Less than a quarter of a mile from here, three explorers set out a few days before Christmas in 1994. Their discovery, a cave harboring the earliest known human art, is the focus of German Uber director Werner Herzog's first 3D documentary. It looks as if it had been done yesterday. The paintings date back 32,000 years and were preserved for millennia after a landslide blocked the cave entrance. We're going to listen to the silence in the cave and perhaps we can even hear our own heartbeats. The interior is so fragile that the mere breath of humans can cause catastrophic damage. Silence, please. Please don't move. The crew's access was limited to just four hours a day for six days. So it's five past three. We have one hour. This could be the world's only chance to glimpse the caves, which may never again be open to the public. And of course, it wouldn't be a Werner Herzog dock without his trademark musings. Sometimes we were overcome by a strange, irrational sensation, as if we were disturbing the Paleolithic people in their work. It felt like eyes upon us. A refugee camp deep in the Algerian desert is home to the world's most remote film festival. Fisahara. <laughs> Set up to highlight the plight of the Sahrawi people who fled here to avoid fighting in Western Sahara, it's attracted a number of high-profile backers. There are like 300,000 people abandoned in the middle of the desert since more than 30 years ago. Uh, the humanitarian situation is going worse and worse. There's workshops for camp residents and films from all over the world, including some by the refugees themselves. It gives an opportunity to our young people to get to know other cultures. It's also a chance for the people that come here to get to know the tough situation of the Sahrawi people. I've liked the movies that have been shown a lot. It's nice that they've brought all these important people here. That's it for this fabulous picture show. Now, the themes of all your films, mystery, thriller, and Alex has just confessed that he was a comic book hero. So tell us your heroes, tell us your villains. Yeah, I didn't like DC Comics. I liked the Marvel Comics. Spider-Man, very dark. Hulk, like that anger. Um, <laughs> X-Men, the mutants, you know, always the outsiders. Very interesting to me. But why not Superman? Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. You know, always Mr. Clean Jeans. Nothing ever wrong with Superman. Always good, always all-powerful. Boring. He is like the poster boy of a man out of control. But these other guys aren't. These other politicians aren't. I mean, Bill Clinton is one of the most popular figures in American politics. And he got a job in the Oval Office. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably give it about 7 or 8 out of 10. And not only was he entertaining, but he was able to make us feel a degree of sympathy for Spitzer. No matter how powerful you think you are, you can be, there's somebody bigger and you can be felled by. The power that comes behind the media, who, who's pushing that power, it was very enlightening in that way. In years to come, this would probably be something that will be on the school curriculum. You know, watch this to see what not to do.